Hello, my name is Rima, and welcome to the True Story Channel. All children in this world are the greatest gift from a higher power. Every child born into this world deserves love and care. In this video, we will witness a heart-wrenching tragedy that befell a little girl. However, before we proceed, I would like to remind you that the story we are about to share is a true event, not a fictional movie. This story takes place in Spokane, Washington, on July 13th, 1950. A couple, Elaine and Carl Rogers, welcomed a baby girl into the world. They named her Candace, but she was affectionately known as Candy. As an only child, Candy was deeply loved by both her parents. However, not everything was perfect. Elaine and Carl's marriage faced serious challenges, and eventually, they decided to separate. Despite this, Candy's childhood remained joyful as she was raised by her mother, Elaine, who worked as a school teacher. Elaine ensured that her daughter received the best care and upbringing. As time passed, Candy became a popular figure in her neighborhood. She was known for being friendly and playful, always laughing and sharing snacks with her peers. By the time 1959 arrived, Candy had turned nine and was in fourth grade at Holmes Elementary School. Like many other young girls, Candy was a member of an organization called the Campfire Girls, which was similar to the Girl Scouts, but exclusively for girls. In this group, children were taught to be independent and connected to nature. Candy actively participated in camping trips, hiking, and learning about indigenous cultures. Her enthusiasm and intelligence made her stand out, impressing even her mother's colleagues who predicted a bright future for her. On the afternoon of March 6, 1959, Candy returned home from school. It was a Friday, her favorite day of the week, as it meant she could spend more time playing with her friends. However, she remembered a task assigned by her Campfire Girls leader, selling chocolates and mint candies to raise funds for an upcoming recreational activity. Candy had seven boxes of chocolates and mints ready to sell, and she planned to visit her neighbors door to door. Candy asked her mother, Elaine, for permission to go out and sell the candy. Elaine allowed her to go on the condition that she return home before sunset. This was a new rule Elaine had just set, as previously she only allowed Candy to play outside during the day. But this time, she understood the value of the lesson the Campfire Girls were teaching. Although Elaine felt a bit uneasy, worried about the possibility of Candy encountering strangers, she trusted her daughter. Candy had already coordinated with her friends over the phone, deciding that they would each take different routes to avoid selling in the same area. Before leaving, Candy enjoyed a snack, homemade oatmeal cookies, and played briefly with her beloved dog, Beverly. At exactly five in the afternoon, Candy set out with her seven boxes of chocolates and mints. She met up with some of her friends who had gathered in front of their houses, and they all parted ways according to their plan, going door to door selling their treats. The neighborhood was accustomed to seeing young girls selling chocolates and candies, as the Campfire Girls held similar fundraisers every year. Time passed quickly, and soon the sun began to set. Elaine, sitting on the porch, grew anxious as her daughter had not yet returned home. It was now past 5.30, and while the other girls had already come back, there was still no sign of candy. Elaine's concern deepened, as she knew candy disliked being out after dark. As the minutes dragged on, each one feeling like hours, Elaine's worry turned into dread. When the clock struck six in the evening, her anxiety peaked. She was convinced that something was terribly wrong. Elaine reached out to Candy's grandfather, Stanley, explaining the situation. She also informed the neighbors, asking if anyone had seen her daughter. Stanley quickly gathered a search party, and they began asking neighbors if they had noticed which direction Candy had gone. Several people mentioned seeing the young girl walking with her candy boxes, but no one knew where she was or why she hadn't returned. At seven o'clock, Stanley and his group expanded their search, moving closer to the main road. It was dangerous as they nearly got hit by speeding cars, but they continued undeterred. By nine that night, the search party discovered some of Candy's candy boxes scattered across the street. They found six boxes, which indicated that Candy had only managed to sell one before something happened. Sadly, their efforts to locate her that evening proved fruitless. Elaine, unable to sleep, was consumed by worry. Dark thoughts filled her mind as she feared the worst for her beloved daughter. A mother's intuition often speaks volumes, and on that fateful day, she felt that something was terribly wrong with her daughter. Silently, she wept and prayed that Candy would return home safely. By the next morning, the entire city of Spokane had learned of Candy's disappearance. 
The community came together, organizing large groups to help with the search. Meanwhile, the police deployed mounted officers, patrol cars, and even helicopters to assist from the air. Specialized teams, including divers, were sent to search the rivers and lakes of Spokane. The citizens and volunteers scoured the nearby forests, calling out Candy's name with every step. The U.S. Air Force also joined the search efforts, using their helicopters to comb through the area. Unfortunately, tragedy struck during the search. A helicopter piloted by Merlis Day, along with Sergeant William A. McDaniel and Lieutenant Kenneth G. Foch, crashed into a river after colliding with high-voltage power lines. The accident claimed the lives of the three servicemen. Despite this devastating loss, the community and police remained determined, pressing on with their efforts to find Candy. No one wanted the sacrifice of those three brave men to be in vain. Days turned into weeks, and the search had now lasted for more than two weeks. Candy's mother, Elaine, grew increasingly distraught, unable to eat or sleep. Candy's absence was breaking her spirit. Elaine, already burdened by the weight of her loss, began to suffer mentally, with her hope dwindling by the hour. On the afternoon of the 22nd of March, two local loggers, Howard Lawrence and Richard Berg, stumbled upon something unsettling while gathering firewood in a forest about seven miles from Candy's home. They spotted a small pair of shoes, a child's shoes, made of sturdy leather and dark blue in color. Bewildered by how such a small item had ended up in the middle of the forest, they waited for some time, hoping someone might come looking for them. When no one appeared, they picked up the shoes and brought them to the authorities. The news of the shoes quickly spread throughout the town, and the police contacted Stanley, Candy's grandfather, to see if he could identify them. Upon seeing the shoes, Stanley acknowledged that they closely resembled the pair Candy often wore. With this potential clue in hand, the police launched an intense search in the surrounding forest area. The following day, search teams and volunteers swarmed the location where the shoes were found. They combed the forest for hours, but Candy was nowhere to be seen. Just as hope was beginning to fade again, one officer noticed a suspicious pile of branches and pine needles. Upon closer inspection, he discovered something horrifying, a small foot sticking out from underneath the pile. Frantically, the officer began to remove the debris, revealing the lifeless body of a child. The officer's heart sank, as he knew this was likely candy. The child's clothing was torn, and her feet were bound with strips of fabric, seemingly ripped from her own clothes. The officer called for assistance, and Candy's body was taken to the hospital for an autopsy. Candy's parents were immediately contacted, and both Elaine and Stanley rushed to the hospital. When Elaine saw her daughter, she collapsed in shock, losing consciousness. She woke up screaming and had to be sedated by medical personnel. Stanley, meanwhile, remained in silent agony as he faced the grim reality of what had happened to his beloved granddaughter. The entire city of Spokane was shaken by the tragic news. Fear and concern swept through the community as parents began worrying for the safety of their own children. In the hospital, the medical examiners confirmed the terrible truth. Candy had been assaulted and left to perish in the forest. Strangely, her body had a lingering scent of grape-flavored chewing gum, which puzzled the investigators. It was suggested that Candy might have been chewing gum when the horrific events occurred. The police launched a full-scale investigation to find the person responsible for Candy's death. They soon zeroed in on several suspects, including a man named Hugh Bayon Morse, a notorious criminal who had previously served many years in prison. Known for his disturbing history and peculiar habit of chewing grape-flavored gum, he seemed like a plausible suspect. Investigators believed that the scent on Candy's body could have come from her attacker. However, after undergoing a polygraph test, Hugh Bayon Morse was found to be telling the truth when he denied any involvement in Candy's case. Eventually, he was ruled out as a suspect. In a high-profile case that had perplexed the authorities for years, the investigation into the disappearance of Candy took a significant turn. Initially, the police lacked sufficient evidence and began suspecting a 50-year-old man named Alfred Gray, known for his troubling past. However, just like with previous suspects, there was no solid proof linking him to the crime. The police were left frustrated, despite receiving numerous tips from the public, none of which led to any concrete evidence. Meanwhile, Candy's family held a private funeral, devastated by the loss of their beloved daughter. Elin and Stanley, Candy's parents, hoped for justice and that the perpetrator would be brought to light and punished accordingly. Tragically, in June of 1963, four years after Candy's disappearance, her father, Carl, took his own life. 
He had been living in a different location at the time of Candy's disappearance and was late in learning about the tragedy. Upon hearing the news, Carl sank into a deep despair and suffered from mental health issues, leading him to end his life in a hotel in Walla Walla. As the years passed, the tragic case of Candy's disappearance lingered in the minds of the local community. The case was handed down from one generation of law enforcement to the next, with multiple police chiefs taking over the investigation. However, despite their efforts, the police struggled to make any breakthroughs in solving the case. It wasn't until 2001 that a detective named Jack Storman showed a renewed interest in re-examining the case. By then, forensic DNA technology had made significant advances. Fortunately, since the initial discovery of Candy's body, the police had carefully preserved her clothing. The garments had been stored in a sealed glass container, with preservatives being replaced regularly to maintain the evidence. The police turned the clothing over to forensic experts for examination. Soon, they made a breakthrough. A small sample of bodily fluid which had hardened into a semen stain was found on Candy's undergarments. This sample allowed the experts to develop a DNA profile, which they uploaded to the CODIS Combined DNA Index System database in hopes of finding a match with known criminals. However, despite the promising lead, no matches were found in the database. In 2002, the police also tested the DNA against Hugh Deanne, a previous suspect, but to their disappointment, the results were negative. They later tried the same process with Alfred, another suspect, but the results were again inconclusive. Years later, in 2006, Candy's mother, Elin, passed away at the age of 82. Her life had been overshadowed by grief after the loss of her only daughter, a sadness that ultimately took a toll on her health. A breakthrough in forensic technology came in 2017, when genetic genealogy became a new tool in solving cold cases across the United States. This technique had proven successful in solving other unsolved crimes, and detectives decided to apply it to Candy's case. A forensic expert named Brittany Ride was brought in to apply the method. She retrieved the DNA sample from Candy's clothing, which had been preserved in cold storage since 2001. After analyzing the sample, Brittany realized that it had deteriorated too much to be used for genetic genealogy analysis. This discovery left both the detectives and Candy's family deeply disappointed. However, hope was reignited when, a year later, in 2018, investigators found a laboratory capable of analyzing degraded DNA samples. The lab, called Othram, was located in Texas. Brittany sent the DNA sample to the Othram lab, and after six months of testing, the lab announced a breakthrough. They had found a match with three brothers who could be potential suspects, John, Andrew, and Terry Hoff. Unfortunately, by that time, all three brothers had passed away. Further investigation revealed that John Hoff, one of the three brothers, had a daughter named Katie. The police contacted Katie, who agreed to provide her DNA for comparison. The results were startling. Katie's DNA closely matched the profile of the perpetrator, indicating a strong likelihood that John Hoff was responsible for Candy's tragic fate. John Hoff's background was also thoroughly investigated. It was discovered that he had grown up in Spokane, just a short distance from Candy's home. In 1956, when he was 17, John had enlisted in the military. However, in 1961, he was arrested for assaulting a woman. According to police records, John had attempted to undress the woman and attack her, but she managed to escape by screaming for help. For his crime, John was sentenced to six months in prison and was subsequently discharged from the military. Afterward, he took up work as a street vendor. This revelation brought closure to a case that had haunted Spokane for decades, offering some solace to Candy's family and the community that had been affected by the tragic loss. John Hoff, who worked as a wood collector as a side job, took his own life at the age of 31. At the time, his daughter Katie was just nine years old, Based on mounting evidence, in 2021, the police in Spokane made the decision to exhume John Hoff's remains in order to obtain his DNA. The sample was then compared to the perpetrator's DNA profile, and the results were conclusive. John Hoff was indeed the individual responsible for taking Candy's life in the 1950s. Following this discovery, the police reached out to Candy's surviving relatives. They found Joanna, Candy's 77-year-old cousin, who still had vivid memories of Candy. For Joanna, the police's findings did not bring full closure, but she expressed relief in knowing that she lived long enough to see the case solved and the perpetrator identified. Joanna remarked that although the person responsible had passed away, 
it was at least satisfying to finally know his identity. However, she also expressed sadness that neither her parents nor Candy's parents had lived to see the resolution of the case. The fact that it took 62 years for the truth to emerge weighed heavily on her. On the other side, Katie, the perpetrator's daughter, was deeply shaken by the revelation about her father. She had always believed that her father was a good man and had understood his death to be a result of depression. Now, learning that her father had committed such a heinous act devastated her. She expressed, I thought he was a good man, but now I realize he wasn't. He was a very bad person. Katie also shared her regret that people once thought of her father as an honorable man because of his military service. She publicly apologized for her father's crimes, saying, I hope this brings some peace to Candy's memory. Even though my father was never punished during his lifetime, this is not true justice because he remained free. But at least now his name is recognized as that of a criminal. I'm glad that Candy's case has been resolved. From this case, we can learn the importance of cherishing a life filled with love and laughter, which is a priceless gift for our children. Therefore, we remind everyone to stay vigilant, stay strong, and continue to love and protect your family. Thank you for watching, and we will see you in the next video.